My name is Rachel. My business name is Yumi in Color. Taking what's broken into something new. I can fight to create beauty. Celebrating my Korean identity. Yumi is my uh, Korean middle name, and it's a name that a lot of like my close friends and family call me a lot, so I just felt like it fit for what I wanted this art business to be. I'm 25, and I'm located in Virginia right now, and yeah. So for people who don't know, could you kind of explain what your art business is? Yeah. Um, so I'm an artist, and I'm mainly a painter. I paint with gouache, which is it's hard to explain sometimes because it's like kind of like watercolor, but it's not. It's mm -hmm. like a mixture between acrylic and watercolor. It's very vibrant and I fell in love with painting gouache. Last year, I pretty much was like, I wanted to practice becoming a better gouache artist. And so mm -hmm. I just practice every day. And so that's mainly what I have been doing. My art has been something that I've been pursuing since I graduated from school. So mm -hmm. I studied uh, studio art in college. I had a minor in psychology and was hoping to go into the world of um, art therapy. But after graduating, just kind of taking some time, like evaluating like what I actually really wanted in my life. And I just really fell in love with painting and creating and just making art for myself and for others. It wasn't until like last year during the pandemic when, you know, I was stuck at home, um, just having a lot of time and space to go back to my art because I had taken a break from it for like a couple months and wasn't fully pursuing it until really last year. Last year was when I officially was like, I really want to do this and pursue hopefully like it becoming more full time for me. It was kind of like a separate business, but I used to make sea glass jewelry <laughs> way back when I, I was studying abroad in school in Scotland at the University of Glasgow, um, which was one of the best seasons of my life. And it was just such a fun time. And I had a lot of time because the way that they do school there is really different from here mm. it's pretty much like you don't really have any homework you just have one final so that's amazing <laughs> it's like I just had so much time so you know I'd go to the countryside um, with my friends we take the train there and I'd find all the sea glass like on the shores and I was like oh I want to make stuff with it and so um, I started making like sea glass jewelry out of it it used to be called a kintsugi shop um, kintsugi is a Japanese form of pottery and it's, it's very symbolic and meaningful to me. It's uh, taking broken things and putting gold in the cracks. So the idea of taking what's broken into something new and that's how I felt about like sea glass that I was collecting and wow. making from. And I was like, oh, it's a perfect name. That's beautiful. <laughs> so, yeah, that was the OG uh. um, of my art business. That's so cool. Have you just always loved it or when kind of was that initial spark of interest? I mean, I've, I've loved art growing up. Like it was part of my life since I was really young. Me and my sister took like art lessons together. And my mom is, I say she's an artist. She wouldn't say that, but she's taught us how to like draw and paint. And our godmother is actually a professional artist. And she taught me and my sister how to oil paint when we were really little. <laughs> like yeah, they were like really cool. eight or seven. That was my favorite class in high school and college. Mm. Like originally I went to college wanting to be like, an elementary school teacher mm. um but i just really fell in love with art again i mean mm -hmm. i've always been in love with it but i was just like you know i, I just really want to study this and mm -hmm. it was the classes that i was getting the best grades at so mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a sign <laughs> i just majored in it yeah i was mm -hmm. like my gpa in art is really great so i'm just gonna pursue that right now <laughs> yeah so how did um your work kind of transition from the sea glass and like the jewelry you were making and then to kind of the paintings now was there kind of a moment where you wanted to make that change or was it gradual? It definitely was like a gradual type of change. Mm -hmm. I wasn't feeling super confident in my art or just mm -hmm. like what I was creating because I was in school at the time and you know it was all about you know getting projects for a specific class done. Right. Nothing super creative for me or even mm -hmm. like time or space to do that mm -hmm. and it wasn't until I went to this conference my senior year so for senior year we had a senior show and I was prepping for it and as I was like creating for that final artwork during spring break I took some time to go to this art conference and when I went there it was super empowering just to hear other artists and just people within the field that I was interested in just being encouraged to other up-and-coming artists and just telling people like just share your work even if you don't feel 
100% about it or you're just like, oh, this is bad, like, I don't know, just stop doubting yourself mm -hmm. and do mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And so after that, I decided to start sharing pieces from my senior show, paintings mm -hmm. that I was creating, and just felt like the confidence to share that more with mm -hmm. the world. I know you touched on this like a little bit earlier, like how with COVID happening, you had more time and space to create. Could you kind of talk a little bit more about how COVID kind of impacted your business, maybe potential plans that had to be canceled, or maybe there were new opportunities because everyone's like online and on their phones at home. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, COVID was definitely like a double-edged sword sort of situation. You yeah. know, it's like it's horrible. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Just what has been happening mm -hmm. and definitely isolating and difficult. So before COVID, I had just come back home to my parents home mm -hmm. um, from a program that I was doing down in North Carolina it was like a year-long program and it was in 2019 came back home and was planning to make moves to like move out but during that time I took up a part-time teaching position as an art uh, art teacher mm -hmm. but then when COVID hit like I had to leave that job mm -hmm. because it couldn't be around you know three-year-olds all day with all this happening during COVID I had more time and space to be able to explore my art identity and just what I wanted to create. Honestly, it kind of was like therapy for me mm -hmm. because I was just going through a hard time, like just adjusting to the changes that were happening with COVID and just personal like family life and things like that. And so I was like, I'm just gonna paint <laughs> and process. Mm -hmm. and you know, as the months went on and other people being home too and being online more than ever, it definitely like grew my art business like crazy, like more than it's ever been. I feel like the pandemic in a way helped me grow as an artist mm -hmm. and helped my business even grow because mm -hmm. I realized more and more that, you know, people with being at home, they wanted to curate beautiful spaces right. for themselves right. and to like have pieces that spoke a sense of peace or joy and that's ultimately like what I want to communicate with my work mm -hmm. I want my work to be something that reminds others like that they're not alone and that there is hope and there are beautiful things in this world in the midst of just horrible things happening that was like my whole purpose I was like you know if I could do something during this time like I can fight to create beauty and fight to create things that are gonna help people feel a sense of joy or a sense of Piece. I definitely see that reflected in your social media, like your Instagram. I think people are attracted to that sense of belonging and the warmth that comes from your posts and not only the art, but also how your captions are always very personal. You're sharing stories. And I think that always helps to brighten people's day when they see it on their feed. Just reaching out to people through your art. That's just so beautiful. Thank you so mm. much. <laughs> Could you kind of tell me how your creation process looks like? So how you get inspiration? Also kind of after you get an order, do you do everything on your own from start to finish and sending everything off? In regards to just the creative process in creating, last year I invested in getting myself an iPad because I really wanted to start creating things digitally. Mm -hmm. And also I felt like it would help me streamline my rapid thoughts and mm -hmm. ideas for sketches and everything. Having this iPad and being able to like mess around with it without having to like, oh, I'm just wasting all this paper or whatever. That's sort of where I begin. I begin on here with just thoughts and ideas that I have. I get a lot of them just like going on walks or if I'm just having a moment just by myself. I don't know, this just like comes in random moments, just thinking about things or what I want to communicate or what I feel passionate about. And mm -hmm. I think one consistent thing that I often go back to is remembering and celebrating my Korean identity. That was something that I had started thinking and discovering more during my senior year for my senior thesis. My paintings were all about celebrating that, um, mm -hmm. celebrating my Korean American identity. And so that's sort of like something that I keep going back to whether it's in just specifically like motifs and patterns or colors or mm -hmm. things like that like that's something that you know always consistently inspires me in regards to packaging I pretty much do everything myself like from start to finish I make sure to write um, intentional thank you notes for each package I like to add a lot of just extra goodies in there because that's just always fun and for like sticker orders I actually just finished printing on all these paper bags because I wanted to make it more handmade but also a little bit more sustainable with me creating my own packaging for mm -hmm. the stickers mm -hmm. so that is something that I really enjoy doing it takes a lot of time yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> for, 
Sometimes when, I, when I'm getting in those moments of printing, I'm like, I'm a machine that's just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it can feel that way sometimes. I edit all the paintings on Photoshop and then print it, test prints. I can't tell you how many test prints I go through. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's definitely like a labor of love. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to put in all the effort and love into each order mm -hmm. and have each one feel really special to right. whoever is receiving it because mm -hmm. that's really important to me. Yeah, that's hopefully what others feel when they receive them too. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah, I always love buying from small businesses because there's just it just feels more special and intimate when there's like that extra sticker in there. You just like feel that love from the creator. So yeah. And in regards to kind of how you spoke about connecting back to your Korean identity, I think that is just so important, especially now to talk about. I've been realizing too, in light of all the things going on right now, that I've actually been subconsciously suppressing a lot of that Korean identity and not mm. wanting to show the parts of me that are too ethnic. And I think it's it's so powerful how you're actually like taking elements of that and putting it into your art for anyone to see and accept and celebrate. Yeah, I also wanted to, through these interviews, create a space for different people to have like a conversation about the rising cases of anti-Asian hate crimes and how that's been impacting you and your business. If you have any thoughts or anything that you'd like to share around that topic. Yeah, when all the, the news of that was just kind of coming to a pivotal point it hit really hard uh for me like initially i felt more like what's the word a little bit distant or kind of just like oh wow i'm not surprised that this happened or does happen mm -hmm. but the fact that it's so in the public eye now it just it felt more scary and it felt mm -hmm. more like this is reality and i hate it and it's mm -hmm. horrible and with anti-asian hate crimes and everything like that i just felt it more important to share and just communicate the the joy of what it means to be Korean to me mm -hmm. instead of invoking more of the intensity of the situation I wanted to share like actually it's it's a joy for me to be Korean mm -hmm. and I love it and mm -hmm. instead of hiding it or right. not talking about it right. and you know that's something that I have struggled to do like a lot of my life when I was young I really just wanted to acclimate to the white culture mm -hmm. and just like the predominantly white culture around me and mm -hmm. You know, I just, I just didn't like the way I looked. I didn't mm -hmm. like, you know, that my parents spoke Korean to me or that I ate Korean food when I was mm -hmm. younger. Mm -hmm. I remember literally writing on like my table upstairs, my mm -hmm. desk. I was like, I hate Korean food. <laughs> <laughs> I, was just, like, I was so angsty because mm -hmm. I just really wanted to like fit in. I didn't yeah. want to be seen as different. Yeah. And, you know, I look at, you know, my childhood self back then. I'm just like, I feel sorry and sad for mm -hmm. her that she had to feel that way. Mm -hmm. Like that I had to feel that yeah. way because of just feeling isolated or being always questioned, like, why do you look different? Mm -hmm. Are you like, you know, where are you really from? Yeah. Like, you know, all those oh, kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. and didn't stop even when I got older mm -hmm. and you know it's just I've come to realize more like even especially after recent events just how important it is to celebrate that part of me mm -hmm. um, for me personally and to love that part of me yeah. and you know not to be afraid of it or be ashamed of it mm -hmm. I think it was more shame for me yeah. growing up because you know just being a second gen immigrant mm -hmm. kid it, it can feel very embarrassing sometimes when like yeah my parents can't help me with my English homework mm -hmm. they can't help me with like you know just history mm -hmm. or yeah. anything like yeah. that I never really went to my parents to help yeah. me with schoolwork and that was really hard and I mm -hmm. think there was just a, a lot of shame I had to overcome and I think with what had happened it was you know it was tempting to just go back to like hiding and just be like I don't want to you know talk about it or put light into my Korean identity again but I just felt even more just like I want to share that more mm -hmm. and so I feel like some of my recent pieces have been a little bit more about like just sharing my experiences being Korean American and mm -hmm. even just like sharing like fun things like I made kimchi jjigae like a mm -hmm. couple days ago mm -hmm. and that was really fun to make with my mom and you know mm -hmm. just learning the Korean food culture yeah. and loving it and yeah. Yeah, so I would say it's a lot about just like fighting the fear with joy and fighting the shame with joy mm has -hmm. been one of the biggest things mm -hmm. for me in this time. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, no, it does. It's That's so insightful. And it reminds me that wherever we are, there's such a common experience of kind of being ashamed of like our culture. And when these cases started coming up, at first it was like a lot of denial. Like I think because Asian culture in the grand scheme of things is uh, minimized, it made me think that we shouldn't be 
complaining or we shouldn't be trying to share more or put more attention on ourselves and I think that's just kind of what the dominant culture has been telling us and but I think more and more as I see different people speak up it reminds me of the importance of representation and how like representation really shapes what people think of themselves and their culture and I think mm -hmm. it's so important to see more Asian faces online or just on different platforms we see so many pictures of beauty being represented as like the white female mm -hmm. just that kind of like very structured face large eyes and I think that really plays a role in how young girls growing up who are Asian feel about their features and I think that's something that so many of my Asian friends and I talk about that we have to unlearn that part and knowing that we are beautiful and like we can appreciate what we look like in our culture and our features all these things just remind me of why it's so important to keep putting out different diverse faces online and I think that's also one of my motivations behind doing this interview series on my channel is to just show different people and um, Asian stories and things like that. So yeah, like again, I just like really appreciate that you agreed to <laughs> be on my channel Like I know I'm not even like I don't have that big of a following but I was like in whatever way I can I just want to Increase the representation and just like bring to light different stories. So yeah <laughs> Thank you so much for asking me to do this interview and mm. just share I love that you created a space just for you like even for me to process like the things that have been happening within the Asian community and being mm. able to share that with you and you yeah. asked really good questions and <laughs> yeah you. it's just exciting I follow your YouTube channel too so <laughs> I love you. what you do and you know I think YouTube ha is such a great space like I feel like that's where I saw a lot of people that look like me mm -hmm. and, I, I really, agree. it's such a special place in my heart. So this is really cool that you're mm -hmm. gonna have it on your channel and everything, so. <laughs> Thank you. But what would you say is the most meaningful part of running an art business for you? I'd say it's the people. Uh, the people that receive my work, the people that leave notes uh, whenever they purchase an order or just go out of their way to let me know how much something meant to them. And what would you say to someone who's doubtful of themselves but wants to kind of start an art business? Gosh, I feel like I'm still starting, so it's hard <laughs> to... <laughs> I'd say, like, just, just create consistently. Just take time every day to make something, even if you hate it. It's going to be worth it in the end. I think also journaling down, like, what is your vision, you know, for creating? I think with creating, you can continue to do it when you feel like you have a higher goal of, like, this is why I do what I do. So I think just making sure you know why you're doing what you're doing and coming back to that consistently, even when things are getting hard. Like for me, like I feel that way too. Like I'm like, okay, why am I doing what I'm doing? It's to celebrate life. It's to communicate joy. And like that helps me to keep creating and see that this is worth it. Also do a lot of practical research. Like just, you know, get yourself someone who knows how to do accounting and like all this stuff. It's very helpful. So the last question is just uh, asking if you have any any products that you're currently working on that the subscribers can kind of look out for? I was literally just brainstorming just ideas of what to be sharing in the next couple of weeks, but I just ordered a bunch of new stickers, so you can be on the lookout for that. And then I also, I'm working on potentially like a series of paintings on these handmade recycled paper that I get from this artist on uh, Etsy. She creates like these papers and they're so beautiful, so I'm gonna be painting on those and just more original paintings.